Good evening and welcome to Crossroads. All warfare is based on deception. This is one of the more famous quotes from the art of war by the ancient Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu. It describes methods on how to manipulate an enemy force, to trick them into doing what you want. It says that if you're able to attack, you should appear to be unable to attack. When using forces, you should appear to be inactive. If your enemy has a bad temper, well, try to irritate him. When he is unprepared, attack him. When his forces are united, then divide him. When you want to lure the enemy into a trap to destroy them, well, it says hold out baits to entice the enemy, feign disorder, and crush him. Now, we no longer think of war this way. War for the United States is out in the open. Our officials announce every detail of their plans. The media picks apart the strategies. Congress debates it on live TV. We warn our adversaries of everything we're going to do long before we do it. We have transparency, but the enemies of the United States do not. They operate in the shadows. Their main forces are not the so-called boots on the ground, but usually instead the hidden hands. The forces behind the scenes that move the proxy fighters as pawns in their game. They raise wolves to attack us and then pretend to comfort us from the atrocities while plotting to poison us. I say this all because I strongly believe that the Chinese Communist Party wants America to be involved in another war. I warned about this before. Now you might remember my documentary, The Final War, where I said that the CCP is planning a war against the United States. As part of this, the Chinese Communist Party's leaders are planning to draw America into four separate wars, and they believe at least one of these needs to be a terrorist organization. And let's look back in August of 2021 when the Biden administration pulled us out of Afghanistan. If you remember, the Taliban took advantage of this. We watched videos as terrorist fighters drove in an open column on pickup trucks through the desert towards Kabul, where American troops carried out a hasty and controversial withdrawal. The Biden administration, well, they left behind over $7 billion in functional military equipment. And when the Taliban took over the country, they were left with the guns and the vehicles to form a new army and to become arms traffickers. The biggest part of that story, though, wasn't when the Taliban took over the country. That was expected. The biggest part is what took place right before. President Joe Biden announced the U.S. pull out a month prior on July 8th, 2021. Right after, the Taliban began posturing to the Chinese Communist Party. On July 28th, 2021, Taliban and CCP leaders met in China. They established relations and, more importantly, this signaled that the Taliban was joining the CCP bloc of nations that includes Russia, Iran, and others. Now, you might ask what the real purpose was. Why would the CCP insist on siding with terrorists? Well, it ties into an agenda for war. In my documentary, The Final War, I pointed to one of Beijing's top strategists. That's Jin Ken Rong. He is an expert in U.S. affairs, and he's vice dean of the School of International Relations at Renmin University in China. Many regard him as having considerable sway over CCP leader Xi Jinping. Now, back in 2016, Jin made a speech at the U.S.-China Strategic Philosophy Symposium and really laid out the CCP's plan against America. Let me show you what he said in that speech. Of course, we could have other evil tactics, such as furthering the chaos of the world. But the problem with the United States is that it is truly diverse. Among Western countries, the U.S. enjoys the highest degree of democracy. Of course, diversity has one advantage. The people have freedom, such as freedom of speech. But it comes with disadvantages, too. It's very difficult for the people to come to a consensus. The best scenario for the U.S. is that it has a very clear external enemy. If there are two enemies, the United States will lose its focus. This was the situation before World War II. There were two enemies, one Nazi Germany and the other the Red Scare, the Soviet Union. Because of that, the U.S. started fighting internally, even before the war began. Now, if there were three external enemies for the U.S., you could see how that would be a mess, let alone four. 
So China's strategic goal is to make sure that the U.S. has four enemies, and one of them must be a terrorist group. Russia is like one, but it's not enough. Now, let me reiterate that because it's important. Quote, so China's strategic goal is to make sure that the U.S. has four enemies and one of them must be a terrorist group. Now, what's interesting with the recent attacks by Hamas against Israel is how they correspond to all of this. Let me explain. Now, there were reports of Taliban guns left by the U.S. that had made their way to terrorists in the Gaza Strip. There were reports that Iran was directly involved in coordinating this attack behind the scenes, notably right after Biden freed up $6 billion for them to use. Now, probably most the important piece with all this, though, is what's being much less discussed. In June of this year, CCP leader Xi Jinping personally met with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, and he announced the establishment of a China-Palestine strategic partnership in which he stated this, quote, it will be an important milestone in the history of bilateral relation. Now, back to the attack we just watched. If you were planning to launch an attack on another country, if your intent was to, let's say, retake stolen land, as they say, well, you'd normally expect a full-scale invasion, something at least large enough to achieve that goal. Your forces would need to push deep into the country, establish supply lines, and very likely call in foreign support. This is not what Hamas just did in Israel. What they did was send in two main forces. Together, they raped and they murdered civilians. They recorded and published videos of themselves committing unthinkable atrocities. And they reveal now that they've been be they were even beheading infants. Now, one of those Hamas forces then kidnapped survivors and brought them back to the Gaza Strip to be held as hostages. The other forces stayed behind as suicide fighters, very likely covering for the kidnappings. Now, from a military standpoint, you would call this a shock and awe campaign. Now, part of the purpose of intelligence operations is to understand how your opponent operates. How do they react? Well, Hamas knows how Israel reacts to large-scale attacks. They respond with targeted missile strikes and sometimes with ground operations. They've done this before in response to even smaller attacks. The imagery from Hamas was very likely meant to enrage people and make them want vengeance. The pulling back with hostages is very likely meant to draw in Israel. Why else would they do it? Hamas uses human shields. They put military bases beneath civilian hospitals. They prevent innocent people from fleeing because they want death. They want chaos. Hamas wants the Palestinian people to be killed. And most importantly, they want the imagery of it. It's been shown before that when they cannot get real imagery, they'll even fake it. And we should ask ourselves, why do they want that? Well, I'll be talking more about the reasons for this when we come back after the break. Welcome back. Now, we're talking about the Israel-Hamas conflict. We've been seeing imagery of what's happening in this conflict. Now, ask yourself as well, why are socialist organizations all around the free world organizing rallies in support of the terrorist attacks? They held rallies in front of the Sydney Opera House in Australia, where they chanted, gas the Jews. They rallied in Canada. They held large-scale demonstrations in Times Square in New York City, where members openly called for terrorist attacks. The New York protests? Those were organized by Democratic Socialists of America. That's the party of the far-left faction within the Democrat Party. They even posted the announcement on their official DSA Twitter account. Now ask yourself, why is DSA organizing pro-terrorist rallies. Why is it that DSA and other socialist groups, they're the ones organizing these rallies? Remember, they want imagery, they want narratives. What are the effects of pro-Palestine and anti-Israel narratives? Well, as the angry mobs in New York City were saying, they openly want terrorist attacks. 
Now, the big question with this isn't so much what happens to Hamas. Hamas doesn't have much influence beyond, beyond Gaza and their narrow foothold there. But Hamas leaders are now saying that Iran and the Lebanese Hezbollah are ready to join the battle. They already have to an extent. Now, understand what that means. Involvement of Iran and Hezbollah are not just about Gaza. Iran is the world's largest sponsor of terrorism. Their Hezbollah networks have strongholds all around the world. In fact, they have powerful networks in Latin America. In Peru, for example, they're an official political party. They tie in with the drug trade. And alongside the Chinese Communist Party in their drug war, they play a role with the so-called narco-terrorists. Remember as well, Politico revealed in 2017 that a U.S. task force was targeting Hezbollah's networks in Latin America. And what happened? President Barack Obama let them off the hook. Now, what does it mean if Hezbollah joins this fight and our poorest border has hundreds of thousands of people illegally entering the United States from that region every single month? Now, I'm not saying Israel shouldn't respond. I believe they have the right and even the moral duty to defend themselves. The United States is already coming to their defense. But as things develop, I do think it's important to remember the CCP has a publicly stated agenda and their role as well behind the scenes. They want the United States at war with the terrorist group. And this ties into something even broader to start wars elsewhere. Now, to gain more perspective about what's happening, we have here with us Lee Smith. He's author of The Strong Horse, Power Politics, and The Clash of Arab Civilizations. He's also host of Over the Target on Epic TV. Hey, Lee, thanks for being here. Hey, Josh, thanks for inviting me on tonight. So, Lee, what do we know so far about Iranian involvement in the Hamas attacks on Israel? Well, yeah, the the uh, Biden administration is trying to cure the simple fact that, of course, the Iranians helped support uh, and plot the operation. I mean, they're saying, well, we know that Iran generally supports Hamas, but we have no intelligence yet that uh, that they have anything to do with that. The, the, <laughs> this is absolutely false. Uh, that that's where the that's where Hamas gets its weapons, right? That's where it gets its training. It gets it from the Iranians, so they know. They know exactly what's going on. And the reason that they're obscuring this, I see some people on social media saying, well, they're obscuring this to avoid a wider conflict. That's not true at all. The reason that they're obscuring this is to hide the fact that they regard Iran as a new regional partner, right? The, the, there are some important facts to understand here, and that is the $16 billion they've recently made available to the Iranians, $6 billion through South Korea, $10 billion through Iraq. It, it, the, the point is not exactly what they're spending them on. As you and I know, Josh, and I don't have an advanced degree in accounting, but uh, in accounting, but we all know that money is fungible, but that's not even the key, the key point. The key issue here is when you make $16 billion available to another nation, that means you consider that a friendly nation, right? Not an adversarial nation. So that's the fundamental point. We know we know that this, like the Obama administration previously, many uh, of that White House's officials filled the Biden administration on Iran stuff. We know that they consider Iran a uh, a new partner for the Middle East. Well, when it seems crazy because, you know, when Trump was president, after they killed the, uh, you know, one of the top military leaders who was plotting attacks against U.S. troops in Iraq, yeah. you know, Iran, Iran officials were chanting death to America at the United Nations. Uh, yeah. We know, for example, with Hezbollah, which might get involved in this war now, I just mentioned that Barack Obama was revealed in 2017. He prevented U.S. forces from going after Hezbollah networks in Latin America. And so now that we have an open border and we know that Iran is backing these terror attacks, what does it mean if they try to back terror attacks elsewhere? I mean, how do you see this unfolding? Well, I mean, the, the, the Iranians have plotted previously against the United States. There was the famous, uh, famous plot to blow up the Israeli embassy and kill the Saudi ambassador in Washington, D.C. Uh, that, was, uh, that was thankfully discovered in time so that no one was hurt. But I mean, that, that, that could have caused hundreds if not thousands of casualties in our nation's capital. The, uh, the Iranians have also plotted, I believe it was JFK airport, though it may have been uh, 
LaGuardia. Uh, so the Iranians have plotted repeatedly against the United States. And I, I, uh, so it's, it's not just, by the way, people who are crossing the border, though that's an enormous problem. And we know there are between seven to 10 million people, uh, seven to 10 million people crossing, and we don't know who they are, right? <laughs> There's a very large likelihood of real problems. But the fact is, as, as you were mentioning in your opening, there's already a lot of people here who are, uh, who are potentially trouble, right? Um, we, we, see, we see throughout the United States, we see uh, large, large numbers of specific communities that, are, that support Hezbollah, that raise money for Hezbollah, that give money to Hezbollah. So are yeah, these uh, communities like also, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes, some of them are in Ivy League universities, right? So uh, uh, are, are these people, uh, are these communities sheltering people who might cause, uh, who, are, who, who may cause trouble here in the United States? Yeah, well, you know, I think you mentioned before the Biden administration wants to preserve Iran as a partner and that could color how they see this. I mean, how do you see them regarding this now that we know that Iran, that Iran is backing these attacks? Do you think it's going to change things or did they already understand this? I mean, how do you see this? No. Well, they're embarrassed. I think that they had, I, 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 while, while you and I and, and, and uh, our, our, our great audience here, uh, is shocked to see the images of what's been happening. I suspect the Biden administration is embarrassed, and that again is why they're concealing, uh, they're concealing Iran's role. Right? I, 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 they, they know what Hamas is, but this is unparalleled, unparalleled levels of uh, of, of brutality. So no, and if, if they were going to walk it back, it'd be very easy. They would say, look, we made a big mistake making all this money available to the Iranians. We've made a big mistake in negotiations with them, trying to legalize their nuclear weapons program. We are now looking at the, uh, at, at the, at, at the chaos that this Iranian-backed group, Hamas, caused in Israel, the, the, the butchery, and, and, and we, we've had enough. We're, we're pushing Iran away. This is, this is indecent. This is the sign of moral degeneracy for the United States to be affiliated at all with these people. We're not even going to sit at the same table with them. But remember what happened. The Biden administration was sitting, negotiating the Iran nuclear deal, and the Iranians made clear they had active plots to kill Trump, a former Trump administration officials, Mike Pompeo John, uh, 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 and John Bolton. And this was the, the, this is this is incredible that they didn't push away at that point. They're not going to push away now either. Yeah. Well, you know, on the other side of it, the Chinese Communist Party, they have an open agenda to pull the U.S. into four wars, including with the terrorist group. You know, a few months ago, I, I just mentioned Xi Jinping met with the Palestinian president and they declared a strategic relationship. I mean, do you think the CCP has any interest in what's happening with Hamas right now? Oh yeah, I mean, I mean, Hamas is is Hamas is part of the anti the rising anti U.S. bloc, right? With China, Russia, uh, Iran, and and Iran's assets throughout the region. Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, various uh, Iraqi, Iranian-backed militias. So certainly they're they're very happy to see what's happening. And, and insofar, I should mention something about the something about the CCC. Josh, I'm sure you've heard uh, as much as I have about the speculation about different hacks yeah. of, um, of Israeli systems leading up to this. I think this is one thing we want to be looking at, knowing the extent to which uh, CCP units are detailed operations. I think this is one thing for all of us to keep an eye out and look for uh, look for information developing on that in, in the weeks or months. Like, I, I, I don't have I don't have a lot of insight into it now, but I think it's something for us to be on the lookout for. Actually, yeah, briefly for our audience, is Israel, they have a high tech fence. If you touch it, an alarm goes off. There was apparently a cyber attack that shut down that capability, which let them cut through it. Um, actually, Lee, you might be interested in this. The two forms they used was they cut through the fence, cyber attack brings down the fence, then they flew in with these uh, you know, paratrooper guys. North yeah. Korea actually developed the model for using paragliders as a method of attack. In 2017, that was the method that was announced that they were gonna use against South Korea or revealed. And the reason they said they'd do it was because they said it can evade the radar systems. 
Now that combined with the cyber attack means they brought down the capabilities of monitoring, which I think actually says a lot. And again, maybe China, maybe even North Korea was involved with that, but we'll have to see. Well, we but, saw videos also of Hezbollah training on, on those on those yeah. motorized gliders. So that's really interesting, Josh. I, I didn't know that. that. That's really important. Yeah, you know, I mean, I guess we have about a minute left, but you know, Hezbollah might join this. There's talk of that right now. What does it mean if Hezbollah joins this conflict? Well, I mean, it mean well, the Israelis have mobilized 300,000 reserve uh, reserve forces. Not all of them are going south uh, to you know to enter Gaza. We assume there's going and invasion, uh, presumably after the Israeli air force uh, softens up the terrain, the you know terrain a little bit more. Um, and but there will be other reservists who will be heading to the north. To make sure that if there is uh, if there is action up there, the Israelis will be prepared on that border as well. Because in Israel's wars, we've seen for uh, we we've seen Arab states crossing, uh, and this is not a state Arab state war; it's Arab terrorist group wars. But if we see them crossing the north, that would not be surprising. Yeah, well, already they're saying that Syria is launching rocket attacks. There was some news of that, and also that you know Lebanon might get pulled into this. But you know, we'll have to see. Lee, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more. Thanks again for being here. Thank you again, Josh. Well, that's all for tonight. Thank you for joining us. And as always, stay informed and stay free.